Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this day, and we pray that you would bless our time together as we seek to study your word, and uh, especially as we study the liturgy that's been passed down to us from generation to generation, uh, that we may learn your word uh, in in that way, in the way of, of the worship of your church. And we pray that you would uh, continue to be with us and open our hearts and our minds. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, last week we left off in the service of the sacrament. We're, we're really getting close to the end of – that clock's not right, is it? It's 6.30. It's time for a new battery. Okay. Yeah. yeah, all right, okay. Yeah, that doesn't say – that's not right at all. I just looked at the, the second hand, not the hour hand, but not even that's right. All right. So someone um, tell me like five minutes till till 7.30. Yep. Um, all right. Um, we left off after the distribution of the service of the sacrament. So we're on page 211 in the hymnal and page 196 in Lutheranism 101. So either or you can have uh, – that's, that's no problem. So. Uh, no, oh, sorry. I, I'm wrong. That's not right. Sorry, I was in setting four for some reason. Um, yeah, 199, 199, and 196. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're at the uh, Nook de Midist, which is the song that's sung right after the distribution of communion. The Nook uh, de Midist, which... Oh, I started writing in English. I was going to... Ah, can't write it all. Two arms, right? Yeah. Oh. Let me just make sure I get this right here. Demit. Demitis. All right. Uh, the nunc demitis, which um, means, I, uh, yeah, now let, now let your servant. That's what nunc demitis means. And so it just is the first couple words of the of the hymn, right? Oh. Lord, now let thou thy servant depart in peace. And this is from Luke 2, uh, chapter 29 through 32, and it's a direct quote from Scripture, right? So um, as, as I just prayed uh, that we would learn God's word from from the liturgy, right? So sometimes in the church when we're, learning God's word, sometimes we look directly in the Bible and then we pull applications out of it, right? And sometimes we look at topics like we are in Lutheranism 101, and then we go back into God's word. It pushes us back into God's word, into the Bible, right? Well, this is, um, just like all the liturgy is very connected to scripture, uh, this is very much connected to scripture in that it's another one of these things that's a direct quote from the Bible. And the context of the Nook is... This, as you can see there in um, next ne- next to the title, it's the Song of Simeon. So if you remember this story in Luke 2, after Jesus is born, uh, in order to fulfill the law, the Old Testament law, to be purified because Mary was unclean since she had had this child, they go to the temple. And, and Joseph and Mary, they bring Jesus to the temple, and there's this saint there, Simeon, who's been uh, seemingly he's old and he's been waiting his whole life, mm-hmm. right? And um, he says uh, that it, he would not die until he had seen the Messiah, right? Until the Messiah had come to him. And they bring him uh, the baby Jesus and he takes Jesus in his arms and then he sings this song. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eye, mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy And it's, then we have the, the lesser Gloria there again. Right. Um, Simeon, Simeon. Go ahead. Uh, one who always lived in the church, or is he one? Yeah, he was the, high, he was yeah. the, he was the priest of the temple. Yeah, he was the high, one of the, the priests of the temple, temple that year. And um, he had been waiting for this moment, right? He was a fa- he was a faithful servant. He'd been waiting for this moment, and 
if you think about this song, right, Some again, this is why we're going through the liturgy is sometimes we just sing these things and we don't think about what they mean, right? But uh, think about what this means. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. He's talking about dying, right? He's, he's not just talking about, oh, I'm going to go home now because um, this is what he's been, this is his life's fulfillment. Let thy servant depart in peace. And, and remember all the emphasis on peace that we've had uh, up until this. The, the Lord said, I, I never actually really thought about this until um, we've been doing this study the last couple weeks. But in the service of the sacrament, there's this huge emphasis on peace, right? So um, that we have the, pa- it, it starts with the Pax Domini, the peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Uh, that's right after the words of institution, right? So Christ's presence is here, but instead of that destroying us, right, we're saying that God's peace is with you now. The presence of Christ brings peace to you. And then we have the Agnus Dei, uh, Christ the Lamb of God takes away the sin world, have mercy, have mercy, and then Christ the Lamb of God that takest away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace, right? And then at the end of the dismissal, after people have received communion, so right before people receive communion, it's peace and peace. And then right after people receive communion, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Right? And then um, now we get this, right? Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. Right? And so this is what the Lord's Supper is supposed to bring to us in part is peace. Uh, that we would have the peace that surpasses all human understanding, right? And that uh, we would be at peace with God, right? Not at enmity with God, because we've uh, shared in his body and his blood. We've shared in communion with Christ. And so we're at peace with him. Um, so, and, 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 and we're putting these words of Simeon, that he's saying, now I can depart this life in peace because... Uh, I have seen your salvation, right? So, um, and notice then, ac- according to thy word, right? So this isn't, um, Simeon doesn't say that, he doesn't demand to go now, right? He does, He's not saying, this is like Paul in Philippians 1, right? If I were to depart, it would be better because I'd be with Christ, but I also recognize the good it is for me to be here, and so whether I stay or whether I go, right, I'm with the Lord. Um, he's not demanding. He's saying, according to thy word, right, that according to thy word, I have this peace, and according to this word, I'm ready to depart, right? Let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Right, so... Again, we're, what we're saying when we're saying singing this after communion is that because of what we received in communion, we're ready to die, right? We have all that we possibly need because we've had Christ, right? We've had Christ on our mouth. So why, what else would we possibly need? Um, interestingly enough, or um, it's not, it, it's almost self-evident. Um, in the rite for uh, the commendation of the dying which I do with people on their deathbeds, um, one of the things that we sing or say is the Nook Dimittis, right? Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen the salvation um, which thou hast prayed. The other place this shows up, by the way, is in Compline, right? So Compline, if you, I mean, you don't have to go there, but it's on page uh, 258 in Compline, we also have uh, the the Nook de Minis. and Compline is a nighttime service, right? So um, the the Compline service starts out with this antiphon uh, before before the song of Simeon, guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace, and then we sing the Nook de Minis. and the re- so this is actually the original place that the church would sing this song. Most often was in Compline. Um, I mean, the monks and stuff would do Compline every day, and the idea was before you close your eyes and go to bed for the night, 
you're saying what Simeon said. You're saying I'm ready to die, right? Um, if it's what's that like old uh, children's poem that? Yeah, now lay me down. It's it, yeah, it's very similar to that, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's very similar to that idea that it that uh, we're ready to go if the Lord would call us in the night, right? Um, and we're at peace, and we can sleep well, right? And th- and everyone knows this this struggle too, right? That um, one of the most annoying things in life is if if you don't sleep well, right? And it and it's more than just annoying. It it really does affect your entire life, right? Um, and it's a symptom of normally larger problems, right? That that you're stressed or that that you're anxious or or you're depressed or there's there's something wrong, right? You all, people always sleep poorly when there's you know a big day ahead that they're gonna have to deal with some big problem. But um, part of the the comfort that Christ gives us in this life is the ability to have peace. That no matter what else is happening, right, we can have peace at the end of the day because we know Christ is with us. And um, anyway, but that's especially true. So getting back into the divine service, uh, especially true after communion. And this is actually a Lutheran addition, right? So we've talked about that snowball of the liturgy through history, that throughout history, you know, every generation maybe tweaks or adds or takes away something from the the liturgy um, because of their context or someone has a actually really good idea or something. You know, um, this was actually a Lutheran invention in the fi- in the 1500s of of the liturgy that uh, there used to not be a post communion ca- uh, canticle like this. Normally, when you have a Bible song that's within the liturgy, it's called a canticle. I don't know why. That is what it is. But there there didn't used to be a post communion canticle like this um, for the first 1500 years of the church. But the Lutherans realized we should take that from Compline and put it after communion, right? Because, um, and and notice this, right? For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, right? We've literally seen the body and blood of Jesus under the bread and wine. Um, and we've put it in our mouths, right? Okay, so, uh, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. And, and think about Simeon singing that too, by the way. This is just more related to Luke 2 than the liturgy, but... Um, that Simeon had been waiting for this, yes, his entire life, but really encompassed in that statement, which thou hast prepared for all people. This is talking about, you know, the 4,000 years or whatever it was since Genesis 3, you know, that this is um, talking about God preparing to send the Messiah for for thousands of years. That he's prepared, and now he's here, and Simeon gets to hold him, right? A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel, right? Which, notice the Gentiles and Israel, right? So the Gentiles is everyone but Israel, and and Israel is, is Israel, right? So you have all people encompassed in that, right? This, is, this Christ, this Messiah, is going to be a light to enlighten uh, the nations, that that's what Gentiles means, the nations, and so ba- basically that's the Gentile mission. That's Matthew 28, right? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That this Messiah is going to be a light to enlighten the, the nations, and he is also the glory of the people Israel, right? That the the glory of Israel is not uh, they themselves, right? The glory of the people of Israel is Jesus Christ, who came from them. Right? That was the purpose of Israel to begin with, was to bring about Jesus. And uh, so that's the Song of Simeon. Uh, then we get the lesser glory, a glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. And that's actually how the, um, if you look in the old red hymnal, the TLH, that's how the lesser glory always was said, right? We only retain it because of the music in this canticle. Um, now we generally say, Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. But this this is the older language, which is kind of nice. Um, the Holy Ghost. If you talk to a person over a certain age, they'll they'll tell you um, 
that they still think it's weird that we say Holy Spirit because we used to say Holy Ghost, right? <laughs> yeah, right. That's, it was always Holy Ghost. And then I think it must have been because of like the cultural connotation of ghosts that then they decided to update the English and English Bibles um, to spirit. I mean, in the original languages, in both, in both Hebrew and Greek, this thing exists where the word for spirit is the same word for wind and the same word for breath. It's all kind of one idea in the Hebrew and Greek. Um, so anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I do kind of like that uh, world without end. That's a, it's kind of a more poetic way to say forever, right? Um, anyway, all right. Uh, so that's the, that's the Nook the Minist. Any questions on that? It's a very, I, I really like singing it after communion. Mm-hmm. I also like singing it at the end of the day. Yeah, when Steve. When I was uh, a youngster, I was singing a youth choir. Yeah. And the leader taught us this song. Oh, yeah. So I was real, real young. I was maybe eight or nine. So I remember learning this. Yeah, great. <laughs> And there's multiple different uh, musical settings for it. Actually, this is worth noting. If you um, – let me just put my ribbons in here. If – and let me get the right thing here. So if you turn in your hymnals to page 925, and then from 925 to about 9 – 41. So that's a solid 20 hymns or so, a little, a little less. Um, you have a section of biblical canticles in the hymnal, which we don't sing much, but these are all songs uh, kind of from the Bible. Because uh, there are a lot of songs in the Bible, right? So, like, for instance, when Moses crosses the Red Sea, he sings a song afterwards, right? Or. Um, uh, when Hannah uh, becomes pregnant, right, she sings a song. Or I- Isaiah sings a couple songs. Um, there, are, there are a lot of songs recorded in the Bible. and the, It's very likely, of course, that the Psalms were sung. Um, and we sing the Psalms here sometimes as well. Right? We're going to sing Psalm, I think it's 146 this, this Sunday. Um, so those are worth looking at. Uh, the, there's a lot of good, good songs there. Some of them... Some of them are kind of hymn style, and some of them are more chant style. But uh, a lot of good songs there. I think, um, yeah, let me Matthew look. Matthew 4 is what we used to sing at church every Sunday. Oh, 924. Yeah, that's just a hymn. That's a close of service hymn. Yeah. Or dismiss. 924 is what we got to praise that hymn. Yeah, we sang that. Okay, yeah, that's a... Um, so that's a that's that's a hymn version of the Te Deum, which the Te Deum is one of the oldest hymns we have. Um, so there's a Te Deum in Matins, which is a more chanty version, but uh, that's a hymn, more hymn style version of the Te Deum. Uh, same with 941. Um, I don't know if you've ever sang 941 before. That's a pretty popular hymn. Um, and it's a it's a more modern hymn. It was written um, in 1999. Um, we praise you and acknowledge you, O God, to be the Lord. Does that sound familiar? Okay. It does. Um, it's so the tune is a classical tune. The tune is uh, Gustav Holst um, from his uh, symphony, The Planets. So I don't know if anyone's into classical music, but um, that's why that tune might sound familiar as well. Uh, that's an epic symphony, by the way. If it's a good, I mean, if if you ever like go on Spotify and look up Gustav Hol- Holst the Planets, and it's it's good. But uh, anyway, that's totally beside the point. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, so there's a couple uh, hymn versions, I believe, of the Nook de Midis, actually. Yeah, nine uh, nine thirty seven and nine thirty eight. Are hymn versions of the Nook de Midist. So, um, one's one's by Luther, 
right? 938s by, by Luther, actually. So um, long tradition in the church of singing the Nook de Minis. All right. So, yeah, that's an interesting kind of section to flip through. Cool. And um, there's – is it back? It should be back here somewhere. Maybe it's in um, – I'm going to point out one more thing just for fun, but i got to find it. There's also uh, hymn versions of the Creed, by the way. That's, that's what I was going to say, but um, 953 and 954 are both hymn versions of the Creed. 954 is a, another Luther hymn because Luth- Luther had hymns for each part of the catechism. Um, so we all believe in one true God. That's kind of a complicated tune, but it's really fun once you learn it. Uh, we all believe in one true God. Um, we like to sing that one at home sometimes. It's a lot of ooh. Um, anyway, well, I was looking for the song of the three young men. Did anyone see the song of the the three young men? Or something like that. Yeah, somewhere around there. I might have missed it. Anyway, there's a – so in the, um, in the Apocrypha, which is the stuff that didn't quite make it into the Old Testament but is, but is helpful for history purposes, the three young men in the fiery furnace sing a song after they get out of the fiery furnace. It's not in the Bible, but it's in the Apocrypha, and um, – the tradition with that song is that it's sung on my favorite service of the year, Easter Vigil, um, after you read that reading. I don't know where it, where it is. I can't find it. But, um, yeah, after – it's in the – it's back, back in the back there somewhere. Anyway, um, that song's normally sung after – after you read that reading in the Easter Vigil, which is which is kind of fun, but we don't we haven't done that here. Anyway, I'll find it later. It's not important. All right, so yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to point that out that there are biblical canticles and more liturgical music in the in the back of the hymnal. So the hymnal is a very rich resource. We we really only scratched the surface um, here, which it's it's actually kind of impossible for any church to use all the hymnal, right? It's uh, it's so. They made it so thick um, with so much stuff, but it's good to be able to to have all those resources, you know, in the for if we ever want to do more. All right. Um, okay, so that's the the Nook de Midis. and and then we have the Thanksgiving. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good and His mercy endures forever, which is a um, repeated phrase throughout the Psalter, right? Psalm 107, for instance. Which is the what's well, marked there, and um, yeah, just again remember this idea of God esteemed that uh, the divine service, God serving, that it's it goes both directions, right? That God comes and he serves us and then we serve him and he serves us and we serve him it goes back and forth right so uh, he has fed us with his body and blood and now we give thanks right and his mercy endures forever and then we and then we pray and um, I, I love both these prayers but I do especially love the one that I normally pray which is uh, the post communion collect let us pray we give thanks to you Almighty God that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward, toward one another, through Jesus Christ, so on and so forth. Um, the, I, I just like the flow of this prayer, right? That So it starts out, we give thanks to you. And, and notice the kind of repetition, right? We already said, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. And now again, we give thanks to you, right? So um, that's kind of similar to what happens with the uh, Benedictamus uh in a minute, I have to um, my my Latin pronunciation. I learned Latin with ecclesiastical pronunciation, but I'm teaching Matthias classical pronunciation right now. 
so I'm totally screwed up. But um, I'm, I'm switching totally to classical because I, I got to teach all the kids it. So um, Benedictamus, not Benedictamus. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it messes with my head. Um, so we give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us. Oh, yeah, so the, the way it repeats, we give thanks, give thanks, is similar to um, what's going to happen in a minute where in the, in the Benedictam, Benedictamus you have um, let us bless the Lord, and then in the benediction, then it you receive the blessing, right? So it's kind of a nice um, repetition. Okay, uh, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, right? So it's, I love the word salutary, mm-hmm. um, that it's this this right gift, this good gift, right? That it's a, well, a an, yeah, an appropriate gift, right? right? Uh, the salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, right? So again, we realize we don't deserve this gift, and yet it's a right gift that's been given to us, that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, um, so through through the same is saying that we're from that gift that we've received, from that sacrament, from the Lord's Supper, that we would be strengthened in, and then we get this nice summary of the law, in faith toward you and in love toward one another, right? What are the two greatest commandments? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So... Um, that we'd be strengthened in faith toward God and in fervent love toward one another. So you get that. It's like that. this prayer like summarizes the whole Bible. Right? It's like um, that we've, we've received Christ's gift and now of his mercy that we'd be then go forward in sanctification and faith toward God and then fervent love toward one another. Right? Pastor, yeah. Whenever you say that, Oh yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. There's so many good hymns. Um, the other one's good too. I like the other hymn uh, or this, this prayer. Excuse me. Oh God, the Father, Fountain and Source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent. It's a little bit longer. Loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for His sake you have given us pardon and peace. Right there, we got peace again in the sacrament, and we ask you not to forsake your children, but to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you um, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's a good hymn, too, or a good prayer, too. I keep saying hymn. Um, but I I just, I don't know. I, yeah, I really like that other one. I kind of always lean towards it. Um, I always want to split the infinitive uh, at the end of that prayer, too. I always want to say that we may be enabled uh, constant, uh, to constantly serve you which is a split infinitive, and I prefer not to speak bad English, so I <laughs> just always skip the prayer. But for some reason, that flows off the tongue. Anyway. Um, okay. Um, and then we get our final salutation. So we've this is, remember, our third salutation, right? We had the salutation at the prayer, uh, the collect of the day in the service of the word, and then we had the salutation at the beginning of the service of the sacrament, And now we get the final salutation, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit, right? And this one, you know, it's kind of like a, like a a sigh of relief, right? Like we, we all made it through, (laughs) Um, right? We were blessing each other this whole time, like encouraging one another, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. And then at the, at the, at the final part of the service, we say, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. It's like this, ah, okay. We all, we all, we all survived. Um, And, uh, that, that, yeah, it's a nice thing. So, um, and then we get the Benedic, Benedicamus. Um, I'm gonna say, you can say Benedicamus. I don't does doesn't really matter to me. Um, but uh, the word uh, is literally what it is. Uh, bless we the Lord, right? So that's what Benedicamus means, or Benedicamus is bless we the Lord, and. Uh, so we say together, bless we the Lord, and then and then we all bless the Lord, right? Thanks be to God. And I've, I know I've talked about this before, but this idea of blessing, right? It's the idea of blessing is that everything would be made uh, right and good, and the person who deserves blessing is God, 
right? Because he's the only one that is perfectly right and good. And so we bless the Lord, but then out of his mercy, he blesses us, right? He gives us his goodness, his good gifts. And um, so again, this back and forth, back and forth, we bless the Lord. And then we, and we do that by saying, thanks be to God. Right? Because what does God want from us? Right? A sacrifice of thanksgiving he will not despise. That's what God wants from us is thanksgiving. And so we bless the Lord by thanking him. Right? So I, the pastor says, let's bless the Lord. Right? That's the uh, Mississippi way of saying, bless we the Lord. Let's bless the Lord, y'all. And then we all say, thanks be to God. Right? Yeah, we're fi- yeah we're fixing to bless the Lord, and then and thanks be to God, right? Um, and then of course we get the uh, ironic benediction, um, not the moronic benediction. Uh, that would be very different, um, but the ironic benediction. Ironic meaning um, the benediction given to Aaron, right? So ironic benediction, and. Uh, that's from number six, right? So this is how uh, God tells Aaron to bless the people. And notice here, this is from the Old Testament. And a lot of the liturgies from the Old Testament, right? Mm-hmm. Especially the Psalter. Um, a lot of the liturgies from the Psalter. We have Nuctaminus is New Testament. The Agnus Dei is New Testament. Um, obviously, the words of institution are New Testament and the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but the Sanctus, right, is Isaiah 6, partly. And then also Matthew 3. Um the offertory is either Psalm 51 or Psalm 116. The uh, well, we have the Old Testament reading, of course. Um, a lot of the a lot of the liturgy is from the Old Testament, and that's worth noting that we don't. Again, we don't. I mean, I've I've said this a million times, I'm sure, but we don't throw out the Old Testament as Christians, right? This is our book, and these things apply to us. They yes, they apply to us in a different way than they did to the Jews in the Old Testament, but uh, they still do apply to us. And um, this blessing is still a perfectly good blessing for God's people, right? As it was in number six. Okay. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, which is count, countenance is like presence, right? His, his, uh, his presence upon you. And give you peace. And again, there we got um, the little red cross, uh, meaning you you should or you can. I shouldn't say it, you may, right? That's the word may. You may cross yourself and remember your baptism there. Um, that that little red cross, which a lot of people do, right? So the um, and it, it is a, it is interesting. I think uh, you don't have to tell me if it is or isn't, but. Um, I've, I've heard a lot of people say before, not just here, that this is one of their favorite parts of the service, right? Uh, to receive the blessing at the end, mm-hmm. which I always feel a little stressed by that. <laughs> I'm like, because I'm doing it, um, I always do it from memory, right? I don't look, because I'm, I'm turned facing the congregation. So I'm, some, once in a while I have to turn around and look at the words and just the, the devil gets to me and my mind goes blank. So, um, but this is, a great thing, and and again, what's the final word? Right. Well, amen. Yes, we get there. But the final word of the ben, it's pen, peace. Yeah, right. The final word is peace, and um, and like yeah, the the Lord make His face shine upon you, and think about the context of that in Numbers, right? That the people couldn't see the Lord's face, right? And when they saw, even when they saw Moses after he had talked to the Lord. Moses was shining that they couldn't really look at him and see his face. But now the Lord is saying to his people um, that his face would shine upon you and be gracious unto you, right? Not his face shine upon you and you be smitten in hell, right? Um, But his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, right? Uh, The Lord bless you and keep you and his presence be with you, okay? And, uh, And give you peace, okay? And then Divine Service Setting 3 has this very nice, uh, triple amen, right? Which unfortunately was lost in the other service settings that you don't get the triple amen. Um, yeah, it's it's great, right? Um, 
Amen, amen, amen. Right? The, and, and what does amen mean? What Does anyone remember? Yeah. This is true. Right, yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. In the catechism, um, Luther teaches us, right, amen, amen means yes, yes, it shall be so. Right? And if I always um, change the translation in the Gospels, whenever Jesus says truly, truly, that he's saying amen, amen. Right? And I don't, since we use the word amen, I don't know why English translators don't translate it that way because we, it is a word in English. So why not just use the same word anyway? Um, but, but that's what he's saying. He's saying amen, amen. Right? And this is true. This is true. Truly, truly. Right? And, uh, which also when Jesus says that, that means pay attention, right? Because uh, he's about to say something really important that's very true, right? It's extra true, as if that's possible with truth, right? It's extra true. And um, yeah, but it's nice that we say it here three times, right? Amen, amen, amen. And it's that, that full Trinitarian amen, right? And you're saying amen to, to basically, I think, to everything that's happened in the service, right? But especially to this benediction. That, that this is true, this is true. All right. Um, that is the service. What time is it? 7.14. Okay, so we got 15 minutes. So that's that's the, the whole divine service. Um, it, it's only taken us like maybe four, four sessions or five sessions to get through, but um, there's a couple other things we can kind of do in worship here uh, in the next 15 minutes. But yeah, any questions, comments? Yeah, comment about the soft truths. I had never known that Hosanna means save us. Right. And we do that six times in there. Yeah. Hosanna, 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 and then down the bottom, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And it, you know, that's that's really calling out to the Lord there. Yeah. And it also gives different meaning to um, the context of that, right? In the Bible is when Jesus is riding in to Jerusalem to his death, mm-hmm. right? And that's what the people are crying out. Um, they they recognize him, and then the, I always thought they were just given to the Lord. Yeah, they're like hallelujah. Right? No, it's it's a cry for salvation, and then the absolute turn of most likely basically the same crowd of people. Yeah. Crucify him! Crucify him! Right? Yeah. Um, there's one of, one of the Holy Week or, or Lenten hymns uh, makes that connection. This is the other great thing about worship and the liturgy and, and the hymnody, by the way, is you learn things like this, right? And you, it, it teaches you, it's, it's great for preaching, honestly, like singing hymns is um, helpful in preaching because it teaches you to kind of make certain poetic connections to things like that. Um, I got to find this, this hymn I'm thinking of. Uh, Yeah, this is what I was thinking of. Uh, this is a great hymn. Um, 444, no tramp of soldiers marching feet. No tramp of soldiers marching feet with banners and with drums. It's great. I don't know if we ever sang it. Um, no sound of music's martial beat. The king of glory comes. To greet what pomp of kingly pride No bells in triumph ring No city gate, gate swing Open wide, behold, behold your king um, Okay, so anyway, my point is um, Verse 3 Yeah, yeah ver- verse 1 uh, Is like the people crying out um, The king of glory comes And uh with palms and yeah, with uh, with palms, the path is strewn with every strip. Uh, the the King of Glory, the King of Glory, King of Glory reigns. Um, but then we have yeah, and stands of so we have the palms and stanzas one, two, and three, and then the cross, the King of Glory reigns. Hosanna to the Savior's name till heaven the raptures ring and all the ransom hosts proclaim. Oh, and then verse three, uh, the mob replies, "Behold, behold your King." So. 
uh, basically this contrast right between Jesus entering into Jerusalem. They're saying the king of glory and Hosanna and behold your king. And then, but when he's on the cross, they're saying the same thing, but in a totally different way, right? They're mocking him. Uh, so it's not exactly the Hosanna and the crucify, but um, that just that contrast of the crowds shouting at Jesus when, he, when he's coming. Anyway, that's a great hymn. It's a good, uh, like, Holy Week hymn, like, dun, 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 um, Anyway, all right. So uh, any other comments on the liturgy, uh, the divine service so far? All right. If you happen to have uh, your um, Lutheranism 101 book, or Lutheranism 101 book, um, and you flip forward a couple pages to 198, uh, it gives this kind of helpful... Um, What's this called? Glossary, a glossary of uh, terms for the liturgy that, and and we'll just go through them really quickly. And this is um, not just the liturgy, actually, the glossary of terms for uh, the church structure, right? Like what you might see in church. So um, if you're looking at the book here, right, it's got a glossary of terms here and then um, some different church floor plans that are common among Lutheran churches, right? And our, ours is um, basically that one in the uh, top, um, uh, it's about more, more, somewhat, somewhat between the top right and the bottom right, right? We have the communion rail, but we don't have, but then everything else is like the bottom right. So, um, and, and well, it's more like the top right, I guess, because of the pews, the way they are. Anyway, but uh, yeah, so let's just briefly run through these. So the altar, right, stone or wooden structure, uh, which is the center of the chancel, right? And I've always, I made this point before when we kind of talked about this, that the altar, the pulpit, and the font are the three central things in a Lutheran church. I actually talked about word and sacrament and altar and pulpit, I think, but we should include the font as well, right? Um, and uh, because that, the... Even though baptisms don't happen as often, they're just as important as the Lord's Supper, right? So, um, but the altar is the central point, right? The altar is always in the center. And um, someone asked me on uh, one of the students at Ole Miss actually asked me on on Sunday at up there or down there at Oxford, uh, like, what is the Lutheran? Because this student's not Lutheran. What's the Lutheran view of an altar, right? And um, I told them, you know, of course, it's not like Roman Catholics think where it's kind of like magically God's presence, but it is symbolic of God's presence, right? Um, and that's why, uh, you know, we teach the kids and stuff, like when you cross um, from one side to the other, you know, you should bow uh, at the altar, right? Um, so uh, that's the altar. Uh, then baptismal font, of course, I mean, you guys know what a baptismal font is. Um Sometimes uh, it points out that a uh, baptism font might be located in its own room called a baptistry, right? Especially if it's going to be in a, some sort of immersion font, it might be in a baptistry. Um, but for the most part in Lutheran churches, it's a font with uh, just a bowl of water. And um, I, it's uh, most common for them to be, if they're stone and like fixed then uh they're normally either at the they might be kind of off up in one of the corners of the front but normally they'll be in the center front or the center back right and sometimes center back is kind of nice sometimes um because there's a number of churches like this some churches some lutheran churches will keep water in the baptismal font and then uh, people will dip their fingers in and make the sign of the cross as part of remembering their baptism, right? So we could do that if you want. We could keep water in there. Um, you just got to change it out every once in a while so it doesn't get stagnant. Right? No one likes stagnant water. Get some, get, you don't want anything growing in your font, right? So, yeah, right. So, um, but the, uh, yeah, sometimes it's in the back, actually, in the rear, and then people walk kind of through their baptism into the sanctuary, right? Which is a nice symbolism. Uh, the chancel, which is a word I've used a lot, maybe I've never explained, is the area in the, the front of the worship space um, 
where the altar, pulpit, lectern, and often the baptismal font are located, right? So the, the chancel is basically the area that now with our communion rail that the communion rail holds in, right? Um, before it was just that carpeted area. And oftentimes you'll see that, that there will be a difference in flooring between the chancel and the, and the nave, right? But it's, um, the idea is that it kind of mirrors, the church mirrors the Old Testament temple where you have uh, the common place, which is the narthex, and then the holy place, which is the nave, and then the, the holy of holies, which is the chancel, right? And that's where God's presence is. Um, but of course, in the New Testament, things are much more open, right? And uh, that it's not only the high priest once a year that can go into the holy of holies, right? But uh, that we're in the holy of holies every week. Okay. So then the narthex is the opposite, right? It's the, the back room where people gather outside the nave. And I always kind of make the point, we don't really have a narthex in our sanctuary. Um, you basically walk in and you're in the, I mean, there's a little tiny narthex, but you basically walk in the nave. But really our narthex is out here, right? Um, that's yeah. with the couches. That's really our, not, our kind of common place, right? Um, and then, uh, right, it's where, <laughs> the, the book definition of the narthex, where people usually hand out bulletins. <laughs> okay. Um, nave, now this is great. Nave is Latin for ship. Uh, the main portion of the building where people gather to worship and pray. And there's this great imagery here, right, that um, the the place where the people sit is like Noah's Ark, right, where you're saved um, by the waters of baptism and, and you're sitting there in the, the protection of the church, right? You're, you're sitting in the in the ship and you're, you're kind of floating in the world, right? <laughs> but you're, sit, you're sitting in the ship, um, right? Pew... Long benches in a church called pews. I like these definitions. They're very practical. Um, some churches now use rows of individual chairs instead of pews. Some churches sell their chairs and buy pews. Okay. Pulpit. Um, the pulpit is the raised piece of furniture where the pastor commonly stands to deliver the sermon. Um, preaching from the pulpit reminds everyone that the pastor is God's representative, speaking God's word to the congregation. Some pastors prefer to stand between the chancel and the nave while they preach their sermons. That's not me. Um, while they preach their sermons in order to remind everyone that Jesus' death and resurrection have taken away the separation of sin once caused between God and his people. Yeah, I don't I don't get that. Um, it's fine. I mean, uh, I could walk around and give the sermon, but I there, there's a fine line between um, showing what the book says here where it's, you know, oh, to show everyone that this that the the distinction between um, uh, what is it the separation of sin between God and His people have been taken away. There's this fine line between trying to show something like that and then um, yeah. Well, I think if you walk, it seems too worldly. Be paying attention to where you're walking. Right. <laughs> I just want you to listen to what I'm saying. Here. Yeah, people are more concerned about me walking around than they are about what I'm saying. Yeah, so it's not for me. The pulpit has a purpose is what I'm saying. Yeah, so uh, lectern, um, we already talked about this. Lecterns are actually kind of new, and we ended up taking ours away to save space, and now we have a nice podium in here. Um, so, no, oh, yeah, not all churches have lectern. If there is no lectern, this is not true. Whoever wrote this is wrong. If there is no lectern, readings take place at the pulpit. That's that's a very new idea. Uh, the old school way, which is the correct way, is to read from the horns of the altar, which I already talked about before. So this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. All right, sanctuary. Um, the sanctuary is, officially the sanctuary is the area around the altar and chancel, um, but normally people just use the term sanctuary to refer to the whole worship area. All right. All right, uh, sacristy. Uh, a room where the chancel and pyramids and linens and sacramental vessels and altar supplies are kept. Um, and and nothing else goes in there. Okay, or find you. That's right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the old no. the old term for what K. O'Hearn does is uh, sacristan, right? That you'd have someone that would keep things right in the sacristy, right? And uh, at the seminary you had. Um, and then the people under them were sextons. Uh, so you'd have sac- the sacristan, sexton, and people always uh, 
the seminarians at the seminary always vied for that job for the seminary chapel because it, it uh, paid well and you just got to hang out in the chapel. So um, if you were a seminary student, you got to be the sacristan your fourth year. That was a that was a high position. And by paid well, I mean minimum wage. But um, but you got to do church stuff, which was fun, right? So um, and then the the vestry is a small room where the pastor and his assistants keep their vestments to prepare for worship services. Um, some churches don't have a vestry, obviously, uh, as ours does not. So I, I, but I have a very nice large office, so I'm not complaining. You know, um, I don't need both. All right, so that's uh, things you might see in the church. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah. Did I miss it in, the, in this diagram? Yeah. Transception. Yeah. So churches that um, some churches are shaped like a cross, mm-hmm. and which you can see there, mm-hmm. and uh, those the the arms of the cross are called transepts. Would there be pews? Yeah, there's normally pews facing inward there. So. so that yeah, the the church I did field work at had that. It was a big kind of Gothic style church. Had transepts, and then it had a huge balcony that wrapped all the way around to the transepts. Yeah. So. Do you notice in these pictures? No places it show the altar being on the side of the church. <laughs> Nowhere. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> we walked in, we came back. And we started, so. No comment. <laughs> yes, uh, normally the altar is in the chancel. Yeah, that's correct. Um, all right. Yeah, Steve. Uh, I see where the choir is on one of the arms of that yeah. Yeah, I've seen choir lofts all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it it, it could just kind of depends. So, that is how it is. Uh, any other questions or comments? That it's about time. I'm not going to do anything else. Next next week we're going to pick up um, chapter 25, which is a time for everything, which is about the church year. And um. Yeah, then we'll – I guess we'll look at that uh, – after that, there's the heritage of music in the Lutheran church. That might be interesting. Maybe we'll do that. So – and then we're uh, – that that gets us uh, – we're almost through part four of the book, right, and into part five, which is um, – we actually started with a piece of part five about about the Lutheran confessions. This was years ago now, but <laughs> – I mean, heck, we're making, we're almost, we're over halfway through. So we're, we're doing good. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for all that you give us, all your good gifts, especially for the gift of the Lord's Supper. We pray that we may continue to receive it, to know that we have seen your salvation and that we can depart in peace. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.